Okay. Hey, let's, um, so we're going to have a little bit, the class is going to be a little different today in that we're going to have a Q&A and instead of the Q&A that we often have, which is me asking you the volunteers questions who come up to the front, uh, today it's going to be you asking me questions. And we're going to talk about the conflict, conflict, the war, this disaster in the Middle East, in Israel, Palestine. And we are, um, I'm going to do my best to put some context around what is happening. And the thing that I'm going to do, first off, uh, wait, hang on, hang on. So here, there are some ground rules for the conversation today. And the first ground rule is that you really stay present. Stay here, right here, in the room. Because this is too big. And just really too horrible at so many levels. For us to not take it seriously. And just taking it seriously means to be seriously here and to be present. And, and certainly as, as a way to honor other human beings who are suffering, it's the least we could do. And I'm going to do my best to, at the same time, clarify some things and complexify some things, and hopefully all at the same time. And so, like, I'm calling today's class, we're calling it unfocusing. Because what I'm, if you think, whatever things you think that you know, or you might have an idea about, or people around you think that they know, I want to, Unfocus. So, like this, right? Like, just how Wesley's going to take me out of focus? I want to do that for you. And maybe on a few things I can focus, help to focus, but I really want to unfocus. Especially for those of you who think you have the answers. And uh, yesterday I was in a conversation with a good friend of mine who has been thinking about these issues all of his life, and I've been thinking about them for 40 years. And with 43 years, I've been thinking about Israel and Palestine and the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. And the best that we got to at the end of our conversation, which was about an hour long, was that we have no idea what to think in terms of just knowing exactly what to think. It's just like we were, the best we got to is that we were just speechless. Speechless, I think, is the word that he was using. And so... That's where we're going to go. And so I'll do my best to 
respond to questions. And But as I do, before I do that, let me just give you some background about me and, and the experience I have in the region. So I first started thinking about the issues when I was 20 and I met my mentor and my mentor was an Arab of Lebanese ancestry. And it turns out, just by chance in my life, there are one of these few kind of chance things that I've been able to encounter along the way. But it turns out that this man was really famous in the Middle East. And he wrote, I think at the end of his life, he had like 57 books that he had written and developed his own theory on social change. And he was, had been spent his whole life, the entire time I knew him, working on this 10-volume set of the history of ideology. And he was extremely well-known around the Middle East. And he only published in Arabic. He didn't publish anything in English. And it was really difficult for me to identify the, any of his work in English. But he talked a lot about this conflict between Palestinians and Jews in Israel and Palestine. And one of the things that he said, and he was an Arab nationalist, so his idea was that the Arab world needed to have some unity, not for power, but really rather for culture and for cultural identity. And his the one thing he said to me from a very young age, or from when I was 21 and we first started talking about this, was that he said that if either Palestinians or Israeli Jews, and I say Israeli Jews because a quarter of the population of Israel proper is Arab, And he said, if either one of those two sides choose the path of violence, they will lose the moral authority. And, and I spent my whole life really trying to understand what he meant by that and thinking that I understood and that I could comprehend because there are so many reasons to turn to violence. If you just change your focus a little bit. There's so many reasons and so many justifications for violence, including people who would never imagine themselves being violent or supporting violence. And yet with just the right shift in thinking, it's very easy to justify the most horrific actions that you, we can imagine human beings taking. So in a way, I've kind of spent my life as a sociologist of culture and a sociology of just of change, trying to figure out, like disentangle, what the hell was he talking about? And so over the years, I've had a lot of opportunities uh, to engage with people who are involved in peace in Israel, in Palestine. When we say Palestine, you know, and, and it's, Palestinians call it Palestine, Israelis call it Israel. I will just say Israel, Palestine. And uh, I've been to Israel twice. I've been to the West Bank. I have sent team members to Gaza. I was invited to Gaza um, to help launch a dialogue program that we were doing 
here at Penn State. And I wasn't able to go, but I, spent team mem- I sent team members there. And uh, in my time in Israel, I spoke with and met with and became friends with a wide range of people. And if you want to do conflict work or anti-conflict work or conflict mediation work, Israel is the place to learn. I think, I've, I've, I think the, per capita, there are more people involved in peacemaking in Israel than any other landmass on the planet. And I met many of them, Arabs and Jews, and became close friends with them. And a couple of them invited, they came to Penn State a couple different times and spoke in this class. Um, and I met their families, and they continued to be friends. And I had many friends uh, among very conservative Jews and very liberal Jews, Orthodox Jews. You know, I have great stories of spending a week in the house of an Orthodox, the home of an Orthodox Jewish family, and following their customs, except one time. They asked me if I would just please follow the customs on the Sabbath. And one time I broke it. I, I just, I, I had to break my promise to them because I was staying in this room that had a fluorescent light. And after sundown, you can dim lights, you can dim the heat, you can dim the stove, for example, but you can't turn it on and off because you can't use electricity in the Orthodox home. But I had left this fluorescent light on, and I went down to sleep, and I'm like, oh my God, this fluorescent light is on. I'm never, I can't stay here. And I turned the light off, and I never told them. And I always felt some kind of way about that. But I deeply appreciated that family. And I stayed with very liberal Jews. And I stayed with Arabs. And the second greatest number, maybe an equal number of peacemakers in any land mass would be in, the, in Palestine, in Gaza, and in the West Bank. And once I started working there in those reasons, I was blown away by the number of human beings who absolutely dedicated their entire lives toward peace and reconciliation. So I'm starting in this spot so that you understand the, 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 the pain, the, just the distress that I feel watching what's happening and that is going to continue and grow and be ever so dangerous for both Palestinians and for Jews, not only in Israel, but around the world. Because these are really troubling times. And so I say this to get a sense that I've been in it for a long time. And from that perspective, uh, I want to take some questions. Like, what questions? Questions that you have. Yeah. So maybe someone could take take a microphone up to the second half of the room. But yeah, go ahead. So I just wanted to ask: um, What are some of the notions of morality that um, most people are simply aren't aware of when we're talking about war? Because. Uh, I have a friend who's an Iraqi. He um, you know, pretty explicitly states that he supports uh, Palestine instead of um, Israel. And um, I know a lot of the people in states support Israel because you know, like it's kind of made by the West to an extent. And um, 
Yeah. There's a lot of people who just kind of like brush off the aspect of war and say like what is right or wrong. And I, I was kind of confused on like to, uh, to see like whether if it's right or wrong to just say like this side is right or this side is wrong and this side should be you know, yeah. abolished and not. And you know, I feel like just people just brush off the aspect of people dying and the war aspect. And I yeah. wanted to know like what are some of the things that people overlook the most that I have trouble seeing. Okay. Well, one, let me just start with one thing. Israel was in no way made by the West. I mean, Israel itself, the Balfour Agreement and so on at some level, but Israel has been Israel for two, over two millennia. And um, Jews have been in Israel and in the region for as long as anybody's been in the region. And this is really important. You know, many people who critique Israel and who criticize Israel um, really don't have much an, a, an understanding of Israel and Jews in the region, right? And Bedouins and later, and Arabs and Bedouins have been in the region for as long as Jews have been there. So lots of different tribes of people. This is a region of the world where in order to get from Africa the continent of Africa up into Asia and up into Europe. Well, Asia, not so much, but Europe. You go through this region. You go through this land. You have to go through the land. And that means there are many different people who are settling in that land and part of that land. So nobody, no, there's no one single group there. There's no one single position. I have had... There's a saying, there's a, a I, th I suppose it's a Yiddish saying, if I could say, but it, the Jews say it. If you put two Jews in a room, you have 10 opinions. And there's another version of that saying, is you put a Jew and a Palestinian in the room, you have 100 opinions. And so when you ask about the question of morality and like war and these questions, it's like, well, you can just enter that any way you want to enter it doesn't matter. Just what I said earlier, we can justify that. So what I would say, for example, to this person who you know who is Iraqi, who says, yeah, I support the Palestinians, I would say to that person, well, what do you know about Jews? And what do you know about Israel? You ever been to Israel? Not, because he's Iraqi, so likely he's never been there. You ever sit down and talk to Jews? Do you have any idea? What it means. You know, when I went to, the first time, the first day we arrived at the home of this Orthodox family, they said, don't go to the Arab quarters of old Jerusalem. Because the Arabs, because my friend, the person I was with, who was a former student of mine, in war the Star of David, they said, they will attack you. They will hate you and they will attack you, especially you, because you're Jewish. And so the very first thing we did was go to the Arab quarters in old Jerusalem, because of course. And what we got was an incredibly warm welcome. And once they found out that my friend was Jewish, then all, they, all these shopkeepers wanted to do was just bring us into their shops and give us tea and sweets. And we couldn't get out of the air quarters. We, we ended up not leaving until after dark because we couldn't get out because every single one of the Palestinian shopkeepers kept dragging us into their shop because they assumed we were both Jewish and wanted to give us things. Right? So then one day, I'm with an Arab friend. And the other Arabs say, hey, don't go to that Orthodox Jewish community because they will attack you. They will hate you. You can't go there because you're Arab. So my friend and I say, ah, we're going to the Orthodox Jewish community. And we experience the exact same thing. The exact same thing. The Jews who we met wanted nothing more than to talk to my Arab friend and to talk to me. And ask us as much as they could about whatever we knew. And I thought, isn't this bizarre? Right? 
both sides, afraid of the other side, misconceptions about the other side, and I would say, just like probably your Iraqi friends, has never sat down and talked to Jews, and so has no idea. We don't know what people in Gaza think. I know what people in Gaza think. So for those of you who are Jewish, I will say, I can tell you a lot of stories about what young people in Gaza think. After meeting hundreds of them and in being in dialogues here with Penn State students, hundreds of them, never been a single one that supported Hamas. But every young person in Gaza who I ever met wanted peace. And they wanted peace with Israel. They wanted peace with Jews. And whenever they had an opportunity to have a conversation with Jews, they took it. I think that's not, that's not what I hear. And why don't other people know that? Why don't they know that? Right? And the Jewish students who I work with, right, wanted nothing more than to talk to the students in Gaza and ask them about their lives and, like, what's going on and what do you think about Hamas and what do you think? And the, and the students say, ah, oh, you know, we hate Hamas, but, you know, Hamas, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Let me just ask the Americans, like, okay, so maybe those of you who dislike Biden, yeah, what do, you, what do you do about that? Nothing. Those of you who dislike Trump, what do you do about it? Nothing. There's nothing you can do about it. You just get on with your lives, right? And then you travel somewhere and they say, oh, you're an American. Oh, Trump. Oh, Biden. And then they start saying all sorts of things about you and assuming things about you. And you're like, I don't, I don't have anything to do with this government. I'm nothing. All I do is vote. There, they don't even vote. It becomes irrelevant because Hamas is the ones that were able to get the guns. They were able to get the weapons. And they were able to take control. And they run it. And where do they get the guns? Who sells more weapons than any other country in the world? Mine. People get weapons who shouldn't have weapons. And that's what goes on. So it's like, okay. And my Jewish young people I work with in Israel that I've worked with over the years, I'm like, yeah, what do you think about your government? Ah, oh, God, fucking government. Whether it's Netanyahu or who, it's like, ah, oh, fuck, man. Just like us. So anyway, yeah, I would say that's a really long answer. But another question. Who's got another question? Yeah, bro. I mean, I guess I'm a little personally affected by the issue because I'm Palestinian in part by descent, but I was just wondering, in your personal opinion, do you believe in a two-state solution similar to that of the original, you know, 1940 borders or at least something like the Oslo Accords? Or do you think a one-state solution would bring more peace long-term? Listen, so let me, ex let me explain this to those who don't understand. Uh, can you put... Can you put, oh, wait. So let me show you this. So just so you, so you understand. You see, this is the Mediterranean. Here's Egypt. This is what I mean. You gotta, you're going to go through here. So if, if you say, like, oh, there's been conflict in this region forever, like, you know, people say this. I'm going to respond to your question. But there's been conflict in this region forever. They've been fighting forever. It's like, first off, no, they haven't. But to the degree to which there has been change in conflict, can you go back? There's another. No, go forward one more. Yeah, right there. That's a picture. This is Europe in the year 1000. Europeans have been fighting forever. That looks nothing like Europe today. The map of Europe has been changing constantly. The map of what this area 
of Israel has been changing constantly. It's just the nature of it. So when we say like, oh, there's conflict, people have been fighting forever, that's just justification to not really understand the nature of sociology. So go back to the Israel one. Yeah, so listen, this is Gaza right here, okay? And this is what's called the West Bank. And Jerusalem is right there. And Jerusalem was identified as the international community. So it was not going to be aligned with Palestinians. It was not going to be aligned with Israel. Um, that has changed over time. Um, and I'm not going to get into some of the details of the more recent politics. But this is the West Bank here. So this region is completely closed off. Israel controlled this region here, and Israel controlled this region, which was primarily set aside for Palestinians. But Israel left the Gaza in, in the early 2000s and gave it over to the Palestinians. Hamas took over, and this is completely cut off from Israel and cut off from Egypt. So when my team went to Gaza, they came up through Egypt, they flew into Cairo, and they, and they came up this way. Right? So the two-state solution would be this right here. So we have the West Bank, and we have Gaza, and then we have Israel proper, in, in which 25% of the people living in here are Arabs, okay? Arab Christians and Arab Muslims, but citizens of Israel. And one can make an argument for second-class status for many of them, and there are. I, I travel with my Arab friends in Israel, and I saw second class, but certain aspects were like, this isn't really fair, right? But nonetheless, um, so the idea is, well, could this work out? So Palestinians stay here and here, and the Israelis control this, Israel controls this, and then we work it out. You have these two states, and that's good. Or do we need to break down all these borders and bring Jews and Arabs together as one single nation living in peace? And my response to that would be either one, either one, My response is, either one can lead to peace. It doesn't matter. What matters is the people who are making the decisions believe that that is the best option to move forward. Right? And what's exceptionally important, and that you all know this, so you think about this, a very small group of people can radically change the course of history and can radically change the course of peace. You know, when you go through airport security, as I did yesterday, and you take your shoes off, that was because of one single human being who put a bomb in his shoes and then changed travel for billions of travelers because of that. One single human being. It doesn't take a lot to throw things off. And so my thing is, huh, it's interesting how many people I hear talk about Palestinians in Gaza, what Palestinians in Gaza think, who never talked to or met a Palestinian in Gaza, or what Jews in Israel think. What Jews in the, in, the, in, the, in the settlements in the West Bank think. And so what has happened here is over time, in the West Bank, Jewish families, Jews have gone in and taken over certain areas of the West Bank, taken over. In some instances, fairly. In some instances, uh, take Not just occupy, but in some, in some times in, in exchange, that it's like, okay, they're really living with and working alongside the Palestinians who are living there. And in other instances, 
taking over the land. And those of you who are Jewish, if you think that the process of Jews, Jewish families and Jewish communities who are living on land in the West Bank and have built these communities, mostly walled communities, who, who did that with the openness and embrace of Palestinians and did it in a fair and democratic process, my guess is you've never been to the West Bank and you've never talked to people about how some of that unraveled. So just like And I have friends and colleagues who live in some of those communities and are amazing human beings who are working alongside with and have immensely positive relationships with their Arab neighbors, are embraced by their Arab neighbors, and in turn embrace back. So if you say, oh, I support the Palestinians, and the settlers all have to go, my guess would be you've probably never been there. I mean, you've probably never had conversations with people. You've probably not understood or seen the complexity of the relationships between people. Okay, what's another question, Mel? Yes. Do you have, wait, wait, up, who's got the microphones? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and then can you take a microphone up to her? You guys, Leah, why don't you just go and get the mics and take them around? Yeah, go ahead, Mel. So there's this saying that uh, is we're afraid of the things that we don't understand, right? Yeah. And me personally, I've only ever wanted to gain perspective, and yeah. I've only ever wanted to meet people and learn things about people or the way that they think and the way that they see things, because I think that that's very valuable. Um, and I find it interesting how a lot of people want to preach about empathy and seeing ourselves in in other people's shoes, um, but whenever people get the chance to do it, or whenever people are, you know, they have the, you know, th this wonderful opportunity to be able to do that, right? Their, their first response is fear. Um, what can we do when we come face to face with people that are they choose to live in that fear and in that ignorance um, and kind of ignore that chance to gain perspective. Okay, so listen, the first thing is the ignorance may be just our own interpretation that their perspective is ignorant, okay? Their perspective might be truth, but I don't understand it. So that's really important, like really. Whatever I listen to, hey, by, by the way, if you're leaving class, Make sure you see Do and Yusuf in the back if you have to leave early. That's the most important thing. Always first questioning ourselves, okay? Like, I really don't. The other side, though, is with empathy. Look, I, I want to say something about the times that we're in right now. What, what the Hamas fighters did in Israel, okay, the other day, you got, you're going to just close off opportunities for any kind of empathy at all, right? And if you really understand, if you follow war, and if you've been to war areas, and if you talk to people who have experienced such horrific massacres as what Jewish citizens experienced this past weekend, if you, if you understand that, then you stop in your tracks and you say, okay, hang on. You unfocus your reality and you say, I got I to gotta get out of focus here because that was something that just does not allow me to respond to immediately until I sit with it, okay? 
And then I start to slowly take a step back and start looking at these things from multiple perspectives. Because, bro, the, his comment, your comment, is it, does a two-state solution work or is it a one-state? It's like this binary thing, right? Why just two? Why not an infinite array of possibilities, right? Why not when I see what happened with these Hamas, Hamas fighters did? How, first off, any human being, any human being should be absolutely horrified at that. Any human being doesn't matter. It's like, dude, are you, are you, those of you who say, oh, I support I, but I support Palestine, and you know Israel has been this occupying state, and so on and so forth. Did you follow the stories? Did you did do you do you see what they did to innocent human beings? I don't care who you are and how much justification you think that you deserve or you have or can use, or deserve. But such actions should lead any human being to stop in their tracks and say, I can't, I can't, I can't even hold that. I can't hold it. Even if the pers people being slaughtered are your own personal greatest enemy. The fact that I can listen to Palestinian supporters get up and start talking about Palestine, and, but Israel has been oppressing Palestine for ever and for this and for that. I'm like, dude, stop for a moment and show your humanity and say, nobody, not even my greatest enemy in the world, not even the person who slaughtered my own family should have to go through that. Nobody. So you take a moment and you just stop. And then you go from there, right? But in the moment when these kinds of things happen, there's like empathy goes out the window. You know, my wife says, you don't do conflict reconciliation in times of war. You know, in times of war and in combat, she says, she has this quote. Can you, can you, oh, never mind. Go back to, go back, right there. In situations involving extreme conflict, a conflict facilitator is everybody's enemy. Just like I'm every, I'm people's enemy because I'm, I'm not taking sides here. And like, and, and I'm, the, you know, look, do you want to talk about Palestine? Anybody want to talk about Palestine? You, you want, if you, you want to talk about what Palestinians have gone through, I, whatever you think you know, I will guarantee I know more. I've been studying this for 43 years, and I've been to Palestine. I've worked with Palestinians. I know more. And I just made that statement. If you are supporting Palestinians, and you can't even stop for a moment and hold the vision. Hold the vision. I was on a kibbutz in Israel. Friends and really kind of family by adoption of a friend of mine. The friend who I was speaking to in the in the car yesterday. These people are, do you know about kibbutzes? This is those amazing, awesome people. Awesome people. And like my first thought was, whoa, how are they? Awesome Jewish people. How are they? How could I not think that? And, oh, but now let me take it another turn. So six years ago, when the Israelis were bombing Gaza, and I think in the shelling that happened, it was like 12, seven days or maybe 12 days. I don't know what it was. 
But I think 12 Israeli soldiers died. 1,200, over 1,000 Palestinian civilians died. 12 Israeli soldiers, over 1,000 Palestinian civilians died, about half of whom were children. Now, I talked to Jewish people, and I said, they said, well, you know, we have to, we have to do that because we have to pacify Hamas. And I'm like, hold on a second. Hang on. In the middle of that shelling, I called a woman, my wife and I called a woman who worked for us. She's in Gaza. She's working in Gaza. And we loved this woman. She's, we, we met her many times outside. We, we worked together on a project. So we called her. We said, how are you? And she took her phone and she showed her, her bags that were packed because at any moment they were ready. They, had, they knew they would have to go. Right? They might have to go. And she says, my friend just died. I have other friends. The shell hit their house. Gaza's like East Halls. You want to you like bomb the commons area of East Halls? It doesn't matter how smart your missiles are. You're going to blow up a lot of things. And she said, I have friends who just lost two or three of their children. And right now, Gaza is being bombed by Israel. And every time I see a building blow up, I think there are human beings there. People are dying. And I was listening to a conversation with the UN representative of the Red Cross, and she was saying, listen, about 50 to, to 60, I think they said 60% of the casualties that we're seeing here at the hospital are children. And so then... Just like I say to people who support Palestine, I say those of you who support Israel, stop for a moment in holding your minds that every one of those bombs is killing an innocent person. Including innocent people who I know. Yeah, but no, they're going after Hamas. They were going after Hamas six years ago. I think it was 12 Israeli soldiers and over 1,000 Palestinian civilians. Yeah, they were going after Hamas then. What about the 1,000 civilians? What about that? And so we, we jump on, right? There's going to be the, 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 you know, the, the, a, a, a protest to support Palestine, a protest to support Israel. Okay, I get that. I understand that. What I don't understand you know, it's like I talk to people who've lost their loved ones their children, and their parents, and brothers and sisters to terrorism. How, for me, I'm not, yeah, fuck, man. Yeah, anyway, yes. Um. So my question is about misinformation in the United States mm -hmm. surrounding this conflict. Yeah. So last, it was yesterday, I think, where President Biden made a statement and he said that he has seen pictures of Palestinian soldiers, Hamas soldiers, beheading 40 babies. Yeah. And then quickly, the, the White House made a statement that, oh no, he did not, we didn't see pictures. We've heard rumors or we've heard yeah. uh, statements, but we're not sure or something about that. Yeah. So how does his words, like the president's words, affect how people view this? It's not even a conflict. It's a war. Yeah. So 
No, they're, it's, they're, they're massacres, but it's a war. It's yeah. a war. So how, it's always been a war. Well, it hasn't always. Listen, okay, I'll respond to your, yeah. your question, but let me also just respond to this quickly. So yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. American students yeah. follow celebrities, follow influencers on Instagram, yeah. and they see all of them post that they stand with Israel. But yeah. actually, I, I'm not seeing that. I'm seeing people standing with Israel and people standing with Palestine. Okay, biggest example. People, is the, the idea, though, is people are standing with people yeah. who are standing somewhere in a conflict about which they know very, very little. Yeah. Okay. So Kylie Jenner is one of the most followed people on Instagram. And she, she posted oh, she, that she stands with Israel, and it's her opinion. But I don't see any one of these big, big people, like Biden, for example, saying that, oh, Israel has bombed apartment complexes, which is filled with women and children, and so yeah. far 50 children have died. Yeah. Why, isn't, why? why isn't he saying it? So here, let me, uh, let me respond. I'll respond to that. First off, but first I actually want to respond to the other thing. It's mostly peace, okay? Uh, most human beings want peace, and most pe human beings act in peace. And in most, even in most conflict zones, conflict regions, most of what's going on is peace. I mean, people not fighting each other, harming each other and killing each other, okay? Most Jews, most Palestinians want peace. And most Jews and most Palestinians act in their lives as a way to achieve peace. They're just doing life. They're just doing what you did. You woke up this morning, probably the first thing you did was brush your teeth splash water on your face, do whatever you do, right? Get dressed. That's what, that's, what, that's what everybody's doing. And this is what's really important, that people are just living their lives. There's misinformation everywhere, okay? So I was sitting in my hotel room in Paris. So I had just the, the opportunity on, on Sunday when things are really heating up to watch a range of television channels that most people can't see. I'm watching Al Jazeera, and I know Al Jazeera. I have former friends who worked there. I've been to Al Jazeera several times, right? Agence 24, the French channel, which is like the CNN, right? The Turkish CNN, which I know well, and I've appeared on that channel many times. CNN, Sky News, BBC, and I'm just switching between them, and I'm watching to see how these different channels are covering this conflict, this war, absolutely differently. It's propaganda, right? Propaganda. And so it's misinformation. You know, you try to get as close as possible. The BBC is probably the closest that I get. That I, get to and trust, but Sky News was 100% pro-Israel. Al Jazeera, 100% pro-Palestinian. Palestine, Palestinian, 100%. Didn't have a single, even 30 seconds, in which they might lead a human being to feel some kind of empathy toward Jewish people, including the people who were killed by Hamas, okay? Nothing at all. The United States government has made a decision that it will be, that it will support Israel going back many years. But let me speak to that for a second. That's not always necessarily going to be the case. Okay? And... One thing that Jews 
not only in the United States have, but Jewish people in Israel and all around the world have a fear of extermination. I don't, that, that's not the right word, but a fear of just, just the hate. And what I will say as a sociologist who just studies this stuff, I'm blown away at how many people hate Jews. And a Jew. It makes no sense to me. If I'm Jewish, from what I know as someone who's named after my mother's Jewish gynecologist, it's as close as I personally get to Judaism, right? I think man, I'm frightened by the anti-Semitism. I was in the jungles of, of Ecuador one time, and I showed up at this little village, and the houses were up on stilts. You know, it was like I went in a dugout canoe, and I get there, and I get to this village, and there's Shuar Indians. The Shuar Indians are the, the last indigenous peoples in the Amazon who gave up head They used to do, like, engage in head hunting and, like, shrinking heads and stuff. I saw, like, shrunken heads that they, not from these people, but their ancestors. And I get there, and they ask me what my name is, and I say, ah, oh, my name is Samuel. Ah, oh, Samuel. And now we're, you know, we're speaking in Spanish. They say, ah, eres judeo. Are you Jewish? And I say, no. And they say, oh, gracias a Dios. Thank God. And I'm like, what the fuck? You never met a Jew. You're in the middle of the jungle. You're Shwar Indian. You have no idea at all. And you're telling me, thank God you're not a Jew. And I'm thinking, what are you having against Jews? Like, everywhere I turn, it's like Jews. It's it, it, this anti-Semitism that just goes unregulated. In this weird, and it raises its head up. It just like stays dormant. Among Christians, by the way, we think there's anti-Semitism among Muslims. The anti-Semitism is alive and well among Christians. And it's not alive. It's just buried. It lies dormant. And it emerges out of Christianity, by the way. It doesn't emerge out of Islam. So there's misinformation on really on all sides. And you have to be somebody like me. I'm not, I'm not like the, I'm not the best, per, you, you know, I just that I don't know many people who have had a history like I do that have been so connected to so many people in this conflict in so many ways and can, and can study it and analyze it and then continue to seek peace. Like, I see a lot of misinformation. And I see misinformation in the, in the Arab world about Israel. It's like, you guys, like, sometimes when I'm in the Middle East and I start, start talking about Judaism in Israel, I'm like, you guys don't know anything. You don't know anything. This is like the Judaism is the mother religion of your Religion, Ibrahim, one of the most common names among Muslims, is Abraham. You know, Jesus, for Christians, Jesus is mentioned more times than Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the, in the Quran. It's like, come on. What the hell? So, and Jews, I remember, like, I have a conversation with Jews who know absolutely nothing nothing about Christianity and Islam. And I think, how do you know nothing? You're, you're a learned person. You don't know, you know nothing at all. Like, how do you know nothing? Do you, are you not interested in your Islamic brothers and sisters or your Christian brothers and sisters? So in any case, that's my take on that. So, okay, somebody else. Bro, does someone? All right, go ahead, man. Hi. Um. Go ahead. Um, so I'm going to be honest, before this weekend, I didn't even know that there was a conflict okay. happening over there. I just had never seen any media attention on it, especially through the type of media that I consume. 
So my question to you is, why do you believe that it takes such a catastrophic event, such as what happened this previous weekend, for more media to come out about a subject like this? Well, here, listen, this, this, the fact that you don't know about the conflict just says a lot more about you than the media or the conflict, right? No, that's not a critique at all. No, what it says about you is that you're busy living your life, and good for you. Why should you be, why should you be paying attention to a conflict on the other side of the world that, that, in, that doesn't really involve you? Like, why should you be? They, dude, what we need is for people like you, people like all of us, be happy and spread peace in the world. Don't harm anybody. Be kind. You learning, you being all politicized about the conflict in Israel and Palestine, it's like, that doesn't do anything for anybody. So good for you, right? But it says something more about you and the fact that you're living your best life, again, I applaud that, then you're paying attention to the news. And people will say, oh, the Americans, God, they don't pay, they don't know anything. Listen, man, I've talked to young people in particular all over the world, and they don't know anything any more than American students. They don't know any more than American students. So anyway, the reason the catastrophic event is for people like you who are living your best life, who are just trying to get on with life, right, to break through. And so that's what it is. Yeah. Who else, who else has the? Yeah, all right, bro. No, you got to turn the mic on, though. Push it up. So I'm sure you know that uh, Netanyahu is deeply unpopular, like in Israel for the past like six yeah. months because of the yeah. protests and stuff. Dude, the, Netanyahu is deeply unpopular with me for the past ten years. But go ahead. Now it came out that uh, like two days ago, chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Michael McCall, said that Israeli, uh, like Egyptian intelligence, warned Netanyahu personally that the attack was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Do you think that he purposely ignored it so no. that he could work at Zero. wipe out Gaza? No, that's conspiracy thinking and really dumb. No, not at all. That would be dumb. That's conspiracy thinking, and I don't believe in conspiracies in that way. But how, however, first off, we don't know that. That We don't know for certain that he was more in like, we don't know that, right? Because that's not verified and validated, right? I mean, both Egyptian intelligence officials have said that as well. Dude, as listen, man. So here's another thing. That to know about me, and I'm not. I'm only saying this just so you understand. So, when I was a master's student, I got really interested in the CIA, and I just started consuming everything I could about the CIA. We had a conference here in this building, right down the hall, with CIA, retired CIA agents. There were about eight of them that came, and we spent the day together. It was all day Saturday. These guys, they were very popular at the time. Philip McGee and Tommy Ag and different people, right? And they taught me one thing, these guys. They said, listen, we're the ones that create propaganda. When you read it in the newspaper or it comes out shortly after, if it comes out like this kind of thing after a big event and something comes out that the intelligence agency said one thing, they said, never ever believe that. Guaranteed it's propaganda. This is what they said. So, and secondly, if it's in a headline, it's absolutely propaganda. Now, that's not saying it's always true, right? But I'm just telling you what these guys taught me, and I've been living my life with that ever since. So I'm just saying it doesn't matter that the Egyptian in intelligence service said it, said it. We don't know that. And so, yeah, I would say no. Do I trust Netanyahu? Not at all, man. Can we get somebody else? No, hang on. Someone, I had who a else? I had a question. Yeah, go ahead, man. Bro. Turn the mic on, bro. Just push it up. So I have a question. So what do you think will happen next? So after the massacre on Saturday, and we saw like, this is the first time I saw a video of like militia, uh, uh, Palestinian gunmen killing families up close. Mm -hmm. So what do you think will happen next? So now the Israelis have even less reasons to make concessions to yeah. the Palestinians. And in matter of fact, they have an opportunity now to finish this once and for all and uh, get done with the problem. Listen. And the uh, Gaza Strip. Yeah, I don't, the, the level at which, 
the level of violence. First off, look, you, you, you need to under, understand, I'm going to say something here, okay? When we get in these positions, it's really easy to demonize each other, right? Like we demonize Palestinians, so that makes it easy to, for Israelis to do what they want to do in, among Palestinians. Palestinians demonize the Israelis because it makes it easier to shoot off rockets and do all sorts of things that they have to do, right? Imagine what these Hamas fighters had had to do in their mind to go in and commit some of these atrocities. Imagine the kind of hate they had to, to walk them through. This weekend, I was with my friend Rafi and Mr. Rashidi, who you will meet them both on the Zoom. And, and they are from Afghanistan. And, you know, they, Rafi has spent time with these ISIS and Taliban fighters. Like, say, like, listen, you got to understand the brainwashing that happens, okay? I'm going to say this. The, the Israeli soldiers, every, every, every young person in Israel has to serve somehow. You either, you know, men have to serve, and I think women can serve, but they don't have to serve, but they have to at least, they have to do something else in the military. They're human beings, they're not going to finish once and for all. Like, they're not, they can't do that. Like, it, it's not. It's just that they, they I, I'm, I have to believe this. Maybe I'm wrong. But I see the worst part of humanity, and I also can see the, I have seen the best part. And I have to believe that. So when you say that, the, those are words. They mean something that a human being has to do something that that human being is going to have a very difficult time doing meaning what Israelis would have to do, the kind of horrific events. Right now, you can shoot missiles off and like, okay, you don't have the consequences of it. But I don't know why I wanted to respond to that. Who, do you, who, do you, who has the microphone? So, Wait, can we go up here? Yeah, Jack. Um, hi, Dr. Richards. I wanted to ask you as a professional sociologist right now that what do you think is the realistic approach to find like the common ground? And by peace, like how exactly could it ever be achieved? Because I think one party is eventually going to end up unhappy. So then what could be a realistic okay. approach? Okay, all right, so listen. The realistic place, here's where you start. You start right here. Human beings who have been traumatized and victimized, 99% of the time they want to get past it and they, they want to move on with their lives. They do not want vengeance. Human beings, even those who have achieved, who have experienced the most horrific violence committed against them and their family members, they do not want retribution. They want to move on with their lives, okay? This is true in my studies of this everywhere in the world. Human beings want to get on with their lives. Even everywhere. I can't, I just cannot explain enough. And people in power who are forced to give up something, what they do is they paint these victims as who've been traumatized as wanting revenge. That's how the lives of black Americans after the slavery here in the United States continued to be just taken in such... Who, black Americans continue to be victimized because white people portrayed them as people who definitely are going to want revenge. And they're going to kill all the white slave owners. And black people said, I just want to be left alone. Palestinians? They want to be left alone. They, so you, Jews who have been victimized, they want to be left alone. Do people want peace. They may not believe right away that peace is possible, but people don't want to respond. They, they don't want that. People want to get on with their lives. So... In order to move forward, you, the people who are making those decisions have to, un, have to understand that, what I just said, and they have to believe it. And then that makes solutions much easier to get to because you don't put these roadblocks in the way because what happens is people create stories in their minds like, oh, oh well, those people will never want peace. Therefore, I don't have to ever give anything up. I can just continue to hate them and attack them. Well, as long as we do that, then we don't move anywhere. Nothing happens. So that's the, the first step. Beyond that, I don't. It's God. It's God. It's God. It's up to God. Yeah. And I'm an atheist. 
and I'm still going to give it up to God. So, for, do, you, do you have a microphone? Here, can you? Yeah, hang on one second, bro. Yeah, go ahead, man. I want to ask you about your opinion on some things. Uh, in general, we refer to Jews in Israel as Zionists, not Jews. Yeah. And other Jews, we're referring to them as Jews, normal Jews. For example, there's Jews in Yemen. I had a Jew teacher in high school while being in Saudi Arabia. His, well, his name was Jacob. He was against, against Israel, by the way. Yeah, and yeah. Dude, there are a lot of Jews against yeah. Israel. I know, look, the most Orthodox Jews, the mo you know, when you see the most Orthodox Jews, right? And many of them are against Israel because God didn't create Israel. God, God the, the, the prophecy is that God will rise up the state of Israel. But the United Nations created the state of Israel. So the Orthodox Jews are like, well, we can't support Israel. We're going to sit back and wait for God to come and rise up the state of Israel. So there are many Jews who, dude, you put two Jews in a room, they got 10 opinions, right? So now you put 4 million Jews in a room. You got 40 billion opinions. So yes. All right, but go ahead. Palestine has existed for over 3,000 years ago. And I believe it would still exist until the Day of Judgment. To what? Do exist until the day of judgment. With the, but what the the the, the area right the there? Area, uh, the area would be still called Palestine. No, listen, man. Palestine is a name that does not go back three thousand years, my friend. Okay. It goes back so to, uh, here's what I would say to you. This is what I would say to you. Study, and I can send you to a couple places. Study the history of that particular landmass and how the names have been changed and moved around and so on and so forth. And the people have come and gone and come and gone, including Jews, including people who are Palestinian. Jews never left, even, even at the peak of the, the Ottoman Empire, whatever empire, it, Jews were always there. And er, er, Palestinians were all, the people who identify as Palestinians were always there, who later then became Muslims when Islam entered the region. So it's like, Dude, it's been there forever. Like the story, a story like that that human beings tell is is a mis misinformed story because it's like you don't understand the history. The history is so it's a beautiful, fascinating sociological history. So I would say that. Yeah. Can you? I want to make sure. Can you? Can you give? Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Um, I was just wondering, as just like. Penn State college students, is there anything we can do or what should we be doing if we want to like make a difference? Well, well, one is, I again, I, I understand a difference. Yeah, you know what you do? College students, get involved with World in Conversation. Get involved with world and conversation. So let, me, let me tell you a story. My wife taught a class on the Israel-Palestinian conflict. And she talked to, she had, it was a random class. It was like 20 students. There were Arabs and Muslims and Asians and Jews and Hindus and Christians. God knows who it was, 25 students. And she talked to people in Israel, people in the West Bank, and people in Gaza. One week, it went, one day they would talk to Jews and sometimes Zionists, sometimes not. And in the next week they would talk to Palestinians or the next day, right? Tuesday, Thursday. There were no readings in the class, none, not a single reading. Students had to talk twice a week to these different perspectives and then they had to go explore on their own. You know what? It was the most awesome class for me watching it from a distance, experience that I, I've ever seen college students rise up. These students, because she didn't assign them any readings, they went out on their own. They did so much reading and so much writing and they did so much thinking on their own terms and they were all part of what is world in conversation, which meaning this place where you're going to try to 
live in the space in between. The interstices is the word, right? And so, like, that would be the thing. Just do that. Just do that. Okay, so I'm, like, really uneducated about this whole entire topic, uh-huh. really. So I was wondering, like, what caused um, Hamas, I think that's what it was saying, um, to attack? And then also, like, are people of Palestine, like, with Hamas, or are they kind of, like, against them? Yeah, okay, really okay, confused? yeah, this is really good. Okay, I'm going to, I'll end this here. Hamas is a group of people that were able to get the reins of power in, in, in Gaza, okay? It's, like, basically, it's just, it's people who are very militant, and they, and they, they grab the reins of power. There are no elections there. People in the West, in Gaza, don't vote. Wait, hang on one second. Hang on. Yo, hold on. We have, we have, we have two minutes, and I'm actually going to give a, a cool answer to this, right? They took the reins of power, and they hold power, and they're not going to get it. They're not going to get dislodged from power because the people can't dislodge them, Okay. And what provoked Hamas is certainly it, those of you who support Israel, I, I don't know how much you are following some of the actions of the Israeli government over the past six years, but certainly over the past six months. And some of what Israelis have done in the West Bank and in Gaza and what you want to know is basically any time that either Israel makes a move or the Palestinians make a move, they fire up some rockets. When you see the Palestinians fire up rockets, go back and read the news from the previous week and find out what Israel, the IDF, the Israeli army did. Find out if they did something that's like kind of screwed up. And most often you're going to find something. And then you find find out that the Israeli army did something and say, like, wow, why would they do that? And then you go back a week before that and you say, like, oh, look what Palestinians did. So there, it's a lot of provocation in many ways. So, all right, listen, you all. We'll see you. Thanks, man.